All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Board, and I am delighted to be your host. I am a stand-up comedian, author, Center for Inquiry Fellow, and for now, a fellow Earth dweller. Uh, as you know, this is a very busy time. It is Single Working Women's Week, check, American Artist Appreciation Month. And as an artist, I thank you all for your love and continued support. Uh, it's also Fall of Empires Month, which is how it's been feeling around here since uh, 2021 when the United States was put on the list of backsliding democracies. You might wanna renew your passport, folks. As a quick reminder, or have a few, uh, CFI's podcast, Point of Inquiry, is available wherever you get your podcasts. And if you haven't already, you can round out your reading list with a subscription to Skeptical Inquirer magazine by subscribing at skepticalinquirer.org. SciCon 2023 is fast approaching. It'll be October 26th through 29th in Las Vegas. I'll be there. I hope you can join us. And if you have questions for our guest, please type them into the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Now, the signs of growing far-right extremism are all around us. Um, hate crimes, misinformation, conspiracy theories, foiled white supremacist plots. I challenge you to say that three times fast. Uh, communities around the world are, are struggling to understand how so many people are being radicalized and why they're increasingly attracted to violent movements. Uh, tonight, we're going to learn how tomorrow's far-right nationalists are being recruited in surprising places, uh, from college campuses and MMA gyms to clothing stores online gaming chat rooms, and even, surprisingly, YouTube cooking channels. Our guest this evening is Dr. Cynthia Miller Idris, no relation to Idris Elba. Uh, she is a professor in the School of Public Affairs and in the School of Education at the American University in Washington, D.C., which, by the way, was on the list of shortlists, the shortlist for me of colleges that I wanted to apply to back in the day. Okay. Uh, she's the founding director of Peril, that's the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab. She regularly testifies before Congress, briefs policy, security, education, and intelligence agencies on trends in domestic violent extremism and strategies for prevention and disengagement. Uh, earlier this year, you may have even seen uh, an exchange between her and Marjorie Taylor Greene, where our guest was the epitome of factual grace under nonsensical pressure. Uh, our guest is the author of several books, including her most recent, Hate in the Homeland. I happen to have my copy here. Um, I'm showing it because I'm proud of it uh, for a very specific reason. Uh, my copy of this book actually went missing. Uh, the prime suspect was my cat. Uh, then I learned that my sweetie saw the book, was fascinated by the topic, took it, and started reading it before I did. I mean, proving that all's fair in love and literature. But I took that opportunity to let him know that he can order his own copy of Hate in the Homeland uh, through Princeton University Press website. And so can you. Uh, we'll put a link in the chat. Uh, and if you order and use the code CMID, you'll get a 30% off discount. How cool is that? But I am really thrilled to have Cynthia here in person. And I am very impressed by her um, holistic approach to a complex issue. I, I heard her say on a podcast that democracy can't just be enforced. It also has to be nurtured. So here with us tonight uh, to share details on the path to radicalization and to offer ideas about the role that we can all play in working to stop the march of extremism here and abroad. Uh, please welcome to the Skeptical Inquirer screen, uh, Skeptical Inquirer Presents screen, of course, uh, Cynthia Miller Idris. Cynthia, thank you so much for being with us tonight. 
Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you all for being here. Um, really, I, you know, I, I hesitate, as I said earlier, to use the word excited when we're talking about kind of uh, topics related to violence, but I'm, I'm really happy to be here and to have the chance to share and explain uh, some of my research with you. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and so let me just pull this up. Great. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that hopefully you can all see this now. Um, I'll be talking for about 40, 45 minutes at the most, and then we'll have time for a question and answer. Um, and uh, I note that the presentation has offensive propaganda in it in the form of memes and photographs uh, and some images of clothing. Uh, and all I ask is that you not screenshot and share that further on social media. Um, uh, if you want to screenshot something, something that doesn't have propaganda in it, essentially. Uh, so sometimes people do that in uh, really well-intentioned ways, but it's a way of sharing the propaganda further, and I don't want that to cause any further harm uh, to anyone who might see it. Um, wait, I'm just trying to get this to move along. There we go. Uh, so I promise there won't be a lot of text in these slides, but there, the first two slides have a little bit of text because I, I think we need to do some definitions first. So I just want to say when I use the term far right, um, I consider it the best bad term available to capture a combination of supremacist and anti-democratic forces and movements. Um, supremacists are uh, largely in this country white supremacist extremist movements, but also we have male supremacist extremist movements, Christian supremacists, Western supremacists. So you have the Proud Boys, for example, who consider themselves Western chauvinists. Uh, so not everything is defined around race per se, even though it has the largest history and uh, is the largest share of it uh, in the US. I do use that term because it is um, the term used by the Global Terrorism Database and it is sort of, it captures a lot about um, what's happening, but it is not ideal in many ways. Of course, things like antisemitism exist across the political spectrum, male supremacism and misogyny exist across the political spectrum. So it's not a means of defining it um, as a sitting only in one side uh, of the political spectrum, even though that is a term that captures uh, the phenomenon. We saw a shift in the US in the threat assessment from international forms of extremism to what the US calls domestic violent extremism, which includes both far left and far right extremism, uh, starting in 2020. So under the Trump administration in October of 2020, that's the first time the US said that the most pressing threat to the homeland uh, came from white supremacist extremists and unlawful militia groups. Um, that, uh, was reasserted then after January 6th under the Biden administration um, by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and remains the case today in threat assessments. So that was a belated, a, a delayed uh, assessment, meaning that that actually had been the case for several years um, and had the problem had been growing, but really was overlooked largely because of blind spots in the wake of 9-11, which um, is very widely acknowledged. That's not even a criticism anymore. It's, it's just an acknowledged fact about the US government having blind spots uh, in the terrorism arena, really looking exclusively at, almost exclusively at the international arena rather than seeing what was happening. Um, the data on every data point we have uh, available, we're seeing uh, spikes, increases, or records being broken. Um, so we have plots spoiled that have gone up, investigations by the FBI gone up a lot record-breaking categories of hate crimes uh, in almost every category. Um, I'm happy in question and answer to talk a little bit about the response to this at the national levels. So the Biden administration has released a first national strategy on countering domestic violent extremism, the first national strategy on anti-Semitism, countering anti-Semitism, and on um, uh, gender-based violence. It also held, uh, the White House held a, a summit on hate-fueled violence last um, September and they're announcing uh, some, there will be some new announcements in September uh, on action items coming out of that. So there's a lot happening uh, at the US government level, but again, it's, we're about 20 years later than we need to be. Um, I will say the problem is global. I spent the first uh, 15, 20 years of my career working on these issues in Germany and post-unification surge of anti-Semitism and racism, white supremacy there and uh, how educational institutions and schools were responding. Um, so it, we see this in lots of other countries. We've seen terrorist attacks in a lot of other countries as well, but the US bears the disproportionate share of far-right 
uh, extremist attacks, terrorist attacks, we have about half of the attacks and hold about half the lethality, the deaths in the global total on the far right side. So uh, that also is related, not unrelated to, to um, the availability of guns and weapons here, which I'm happy to talk about that intersection as well. Um, but most of what I wanna talk about today is, is how radicalization happens. Um, so how is it that young people in particular who generally speaking are at greater risk of violence um, of participating in violence, how do young people um, enter and why are so many more becoming uh, radicalized, going down rabbit holes and being exposed to this kind of propaganda? When I talk about radicalization, I'm talking about the process of coming to accept a kind of way of us versus them thinking in existential terms so that the other group is seen as having to be met with violence to, to combat a dire threat. Um, and what we have seen over the past decade plus are unbelievable transformations, really rapid transformations in how and where youth radicalize compared to what you used to see. So I'm gonna talk about that today. Much more bottom up and organic, much different use of symbols and humor um, and really different places and spaces where people encounter extremist or hateful ideas. So here starts some of the offensive images. Um, over the coming uh, few slides. So just a warning on that. When I first started working in Germany on these issues in the late 1990s and early 2000s, this would be a very typical kind of aesthetic symbol, a shaved head, bomber jacket, a lot of uh, camouflage imagery, combat boots. Um, and this is then, that was in Germany, this is New York City. Um, and the US version of white supremacist extremism just absolutely copied those symbols used the same German swastika symbols, the same Heil Hitler salutes, the shaved heads, the, um, there was nothing kind of uh, modernized about it. It was just a co-opting of Nazi symbols. What we began to see in Germany first in the mid 2000s is a series of new commercial brands emerge that began to embed symbols that either had direct or coded reference um, uh, or, or were, had plausible deniability in terms of their connection. So uh, this brand, Torsteiner, um, had a logo, for example, that took two band symbols that had been associated with the Nazi party and combined them into a new symbol, which they were eventually, after several court cases, allowed to use because it was deemed that it no longer referenced the Nazi party. Um, so complicated types of symbols, but very modern, high quality clothing that makes references to sort of Nordic uh, Nordic symbols often as a placeholder for Aryanness, the use of runic symbols, the use of, of uh, lots of coded um, uh, messages from the Nazi era and before. We saw brands like this one that used the word swastika, swastika, that would be in English, but it's using it in Latvian. If that was in German, it would be illegal to have that on the back of this jacket. But here, uh, the jacket, which sells here for like 76 euros, also tells you that the jacket itself is um, not just well-made and well-stitched, but if anyone reads German, you can see the very first line there, Schrecklich absolut unbedenklich, means perfectly legal. So it's, it's sort of marketing the legality of using a word in another language, which itself dates back to a court case. Um, and so you began to see these types of coded things uh, emerge. So at this march in Dortmund in 2016, um, we have a young man here wearing um, a t-shirt that for any anyone of my generation or older may remember uh, the American rap group Run DMC. This is the Run DMC logo um, and they put the word for, uh, for swastika hockey flights in the Run DMC logo by removing the vowels. That itself was a play on uh, a, a troll against a left-wing group that had used the logo in an anti-racist way. And this launched an entire legal discussion about whether a word is a word if the vowels are removed. So if the vowels had been there, this would have been illegal. This, and you know, anyway, it turns out it's not illegal. The word is not a word in the German context, at least in this case, if the vowels are removed. And so you're allowed to then drop the vowels out of banned words and start using them. And so then we begin to see that spread, including to the US context where there's no banning at all. And so why would you have white boy uh, on a t-shirt um, uh, that has you know, a Run DMC logo? But we began to see it. We see it in this French distributor here with the word Hitler at the bottom. 
HTLR with the words, the vowels dropped out. Um, so you have this kind of game playing, this coding, this distributor itself uh, had um, the is 2YT4U uh, is, is the, the name of it, which if you sound it out, it says 2 white for you. So that's a distributor of a lot of different brands of coded clothing from a lot of different countries here. Ukraine, I see Poland, I see France, Germany, all represented in Russia and others. Um, so you, you have a lot of this kind of coding, game playing and symbols uh, often referencing like in this brand, an Austrian brand, um, Reconquista, it says the spirit of 1492, which is um, referring to a pogrom against Jews and Muslims in the Middle Ages in the 15th century. Uh, so, but, you know, using a kind of code for anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim or anti-Semitic ideas that is maybe not easily recognizable to someone walking down the street the same way that a swastika would be or this sh sort of shaved head or bomber jacket. So the first part of what I want to explain here is this whole history over the past 15, I would say, to 20 years um, of an aesthetic shift to a much more modern set of clothing styles, coded symbols, um, leading up to what we saw in the U.S. in Charlottesville in 2017, which was young men walking across a college campus holding tiki torches, dressed in you know neatly pressed khakis and polo shirts, um, marching and saying Jews will not replace us, you will not replace us. So this very um, aesthetically different look than a racist skinhead or a Ku Klux Klan member um, is very much bound up in this modernized set of symbols and a cleaned up kind of aesthetics of, of far right youth extremist movements. That also comes with it um, a whole use of humor. So the coded, the coded symbols are not only um, coded for kind of historical connections or for dropping the vowels out, they are also um, creating their own sense of irony and humor and satire and wit. Um, so here, one of these t-shirts says, we're not radical, we're just early. They're using Pepe the Frog, which I'll explain in a minute, um, became designated as a hate symbol by the ADAL, but it's here Pepe fiction instead of Pulp Fiction from that film in the 1990s. So uh, all across the sort of set of t-shirts and, and humor that came out of some of these t-shirts, what they were, what the far right was doing on the youth culture side was really weaponizing youth culture, weaponizing humor, um, and positioning the far right itself as a counterculture to a boring, triggered, serious mainstream, your parents, your teachers, your employers, everybody else who just can't take the joke. So everybody else became a kind of triggered snowflake in their lingo um, who, who just doesn't get the joke, doesn't get the humor, they're too serious, they're too boring. And that drew a lot of young men in particular into, um, into conversation during this period of time. So still now maybe almost 10 years ago, eight, 10 years ago, leading up to the Charlottesville Unite the Right. All of that is one type of phenomenon when you're having the t-shirts be produced by a producer, still, somebody still has to produce it, then you as a young person, as a consumer might purchase it. Um, but once memes, social media and memes came onto the scene, shortly after this coding phenomenon began in t-shirts, you really began to see a rapid development because now memes are organic. They can be created by anyone. They can be modified by anyone. And so suddenly young people are not just the consumers of coded clothing and coded ideas that weaponize humor and try to make light of the Holocaust or make light of um, atrocities by putting them into joke form. Now they can do it themselves and they can iterate and constantly change it. So for example, you take Pepe the Frog who you know, was just a kind of affable cartoon character created, had nothing to do with the far right, but gets co-opted by certain elements of youth culture online who start to put Pepe the Frog into kind of um, offensive imagery, right? Um, with a, a, a sort of um, World War II Nazi uh, uniforms and the Ku Klux Klan um, uh, uniforms in sort of depicting the Holocaust as you sort of see here. 
And then somebody online, some young person online discovers that there is uh, an Egyptian god of the frogs named Keck. And so they designate Pepe as Lord Keck. So meanwhile, Pepe the frog has become so ubiquitous in parts of the scene that the ADL Anti-Defamation League adds Pepe the frog to their list of hate symbols. Really controversial decision um, and complicated. And they have explained that many times. It doesn't mean that every usage <clears throat> of Pepe the frog is a hate symbol, but it means that it was common enough that if you see Pepe the Frog at that during that period of time, sort of 2015, 16, 17, in a and later in a, in emoji or in a in a in a teenager's um, you know on the back of their phone or something, you might want to ask about it, right? So it was a, a way of designating um, a, a red flag or a warning to parents and teachers and others that these um, that this was being used in this way. So. <clears throat> Pepe gets designated as Lord Keck by somebody. Somebody creates this uh, notion of the, that it, there's a Republic of Kekistan. So there's somehow this place, this mythical place, Kekistan, that is um, Lord, you know, Pepe is its ruler as Lord Keck, creates a flag, this Kekistan flag, which you see here. It all sounds utterly ridiculous, right? Like in, in many ways, you just think this is, this is this weird sort of youth culture until that flag, the Kekistan flag starts showing up in real places. So in the upper left-hand corner, you see it at Charlottesville in the Unite the Right rally. You see it down below on the lower left-hand corner in Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil at a demonstration. In London, in the center at the top, the bottom is on January 6, um, 2021 at the US Capitol uh, attack. So you start to see this flag in places, which is you know, now a symbol of uh, white supremacist uh, hateful ideas, some mythical kind of place, um, Pepe the Frog, Lord Keck, I mean, all again, all sounds really ridiculous until you actually start to see it mobilized in, in offline action as well. And so, um, you know, we began to see this in images. We see this reference to meme wars. You see um, memes being used. And then we head into the pandemic. And so, you know, the, we were already seeing Pepe the Frog, the, the flag showing up for several years, that Kekistan flag. Then around summer of 2019, we began to see this as the second example. And then I'm gonna kind of pull back a little bit and tell you what I, what, what I think this all means. Um, the, the, pep, the summer of 2019, I first saw a t-shirt with the word Boogaloo on it. And uh, we came to understand in the field that it was being used as a code word for civil war. When you try to trace that backwards, how it became a code word for civil war and what that means, um, you get back into that same quagmire, that same um, youth culture online, uh, it essentially dates back to um, the, the, uh, a 1984 breakdancing movie that was widely panned for being so bad uh, and became a code word for the second of something, second of anything, and then eventually a code word for the second civil war. But what you then see happening is um, uh, the pandemic hits, Facebook uh, groups start to grow. There's a lot of anti-government sentiment um, in the anti-vax moment, this conspiracy theories. You know, we're seeing state capital protests at this time. And these groups are growing online, these groups formulated around the concept of a coming civil war. So Facebook shuts down the Boogaloo groups. Um, when you know, they used an algorithm, because sometimes Boogaloo is still associated with music, a music scene, so they used an algorithm that had to do, I think, with its connection with violence. But in any case, they immediately start using sound-alike words. So, uh, so the, the banning of it creates a kind of creative pivot. And so they start using big igloo or um, blue igloo or big luau. Right, and so you see this luau up in the middle uh, at the top here, which features a pig roast at luau's. There they have uh, ATF symbol on it, law enforcement insignia, uh, referencing most likely um, the fact that pigs are a slur for the police. And uh, so some of these boogaloo boys, as they began to call themselves, start wearing Hawaiian shirts at the protests in reference to the big luau, which is itself a reference to an anti-police slur then in, in some cases. Part of what gets complicated here is that it's not even clear that everyone within these boogaloo scenes who's wearing the Hawaiian shirt understands this trajectory, where it came from. Some of them are wearing them 
they probably think they explain this in groups for strategic reasons. Oh, it helps us stand out from the other people wearing SWAT gear. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons why somebody could be wearing it. And, and the fact that there is an iter you know, you can trace backwards where the symbol came from, doesn't mean that everyone who's wearing it understands what the symbol is. And, and I found that in the German t-shirt study as well. Um, but you'll see here things like the Boogaloo Boys patch uh, that has Pepe the Frog in it that says mimetic war, right? Some, in some cases, these Boogaloo Boy groups were very clearly linked to white supremacist ideas. And you can see that by, ha by having Pepe the Frog in there. In other cases, we found Boogaloo Boys were marching alongside Black Lives Matter protesters that summer um, in a shared opposition to the police. So the groups themselves were not always aligned ideologically, but they were nonetheless dangerous. There were several deaths attributed to Boogaloo Boys that allegedly that summer, which are now on trial for domestic terrorism charges. Um, and so they're dangerous calling for civil war, but it's a, a concept-based mobilization and a mobilization that was tied back to a meme online that helped mobilize a concept. So you see in the center patch, a lot going on here, task force igloo, which refers ultimately to boogaloo, right? It's a code word for boogaloo, which is itself a code word for a second civil war. You see the revolutionary imagery there. You see um, the Hawaiian reference in the flag and with the palm tree. And you see the words meme-based insurgency. So again, it's this idea that memes themselves are being used or can be used to mobilize um, a, an actual insurgency or civil war. This is really phenomenally different from how people would be drawn into extremist, violent, white supremacist movements you know, prior to the age of social media, right? Prior to the age of online internet shopping with clothing that can be mass, you know, produced easily coded and sold in small amounts rather than through massive stores that have to have a mall or a storefront. So this all kind of creates a much more organic and playful um, way of engaging with very violent and extreme ideas that has proven to be, has seems to be attractive to a bigger number of people. So in the book, th that's the, the kind of problem that sets up the book. And what I do in the book is take a chapter, several chapters that, that trace case studies, as Leanne was saying, of the kinds of unusual places and spaces where people might encounter these ideas um, in less, traditional ways and ways that are less couched in violent ideas and more in everyday life in which those uh, racist or extremist or supremacist or anti-democratic ideas are inserted. So here's a screenshot on the lower left of a, of a small but vegan neo-Nazi cooking show that ran in Germany for a while in which these guys would wear balaclavas and you know cook a vegan recipe while sharing kind of anti-immigrant ideas. We saw leading up to the pandemic, um, the two images in the top, um, higher education campuses being the number one place where um, uh, white supremacist propaganda flyers were targeting. That changed in the pandemic to kind of town squares and dog parks and other places where people were still spending time because campuses emptied out. But campuses have become a kind of a site for a lot of this contestation and a site for a lot of the propaganda sharing. Um, similarly, uh, especially in Europe and Russia, we've seen mixed martial arts and combat sports be a site for recruitment, both for Islamist extremism, Islamist movements, and for far-right white supremacist and neo-Nazi movements. And in the latter, in the white supremacist neo-Nazi movements, there are tournaments, there are live streamed um, competitions that are kind of owned and operated or run by groups with ties to organized formal um, neo-Nazi or extremist scenes. So uh, we have thankfully had less of that in the United States, but there is some of those pockets of things happening as well. And there were some of that related to Charlottesville with small groups um, related to combat sports. Um, and you see this on the kind of, uh, um, uh, uh, ubiquitously in online spaces, online gaming, but also online social media spaces like this screenshot 
where you see um, on, on sort of image sharing sites, um, people using imagery that is much different from those aesthetic images I showed you at the beginning with the shaved heads and the angry men and the Nazi salutes and the Heil Hitler. Instead, you have this blonde woman, you know, typically walking through a kind of a field of wheat or, you know, uh, in, in a wood with dappled light and a little deer um, uh, here guiding someone with her hand behind her or young children standing. But then the language that's used, defend your land or you know, um, telling people not to mix with others um, uh, racially. And so those kinds of messages, white supremacist ideas or anti-government ideas or extreme ideas, violent ideas are layered onto images that are much more aesthetically pleasing and might attract people initially to them. So I'm not gonna go into those, each of those chapters in great detail um, because instead I wanna, I wanna turn to what I think is the more much more optimistic side of things. What can we do about it? So if we, if we have for 20 years in this country had a history of countering extremism by understanding groups essentially, right? So we have understood uh, that you counter extremism by trying to infiltrate and surveil or monitor groups, break up their plots. Um, and, and those to be fair uh, have been successful many of those efforts of breaking up plots. We've seen a lot of that, including on the white supremacist side. But it's a much different scenario um, when what you're trying to interrupt is a, is a sort of sole individual who's been radicalized through a network online of ideas that are embedded in memes and emojis and, and uh, t-shirts and jokes and chat rooms that are harder to monitor or predict because it's the individual who's planning and, and acting. And, and really every major terrorist attack we've had from the far right going all the way back to Oklahoma City, um, everyone that has been successfully executed in Pittsburgh, in El Paso, in Buffalo, in uh, Charleston, anywhere you can think of has been at the hands of an individual who did not have formal membership or ties um, in an extremist group. So it so those are um, the, the violence that happens, happens at the hands of individuals who are radicalized by ideas they are encountering, um, but not by other individuals um, in a group where they hold membership and went through initiation rights and had a manifesto that was clear and logical that you could follow and understand and then try to counter with ideas. So it's a much different problem. Um, and if we used to think of, of the way to address this as kind of isolating a few bad cells from everybody else, make sure that the tumor is kind of excised and kept away. Um, and now we have to think of the problem as, a, as much more like a viral spread um, that can spread into the mainstream because there are so many channels and pathways for it to, to enter. Um, we have to, I argue in the book and in my work more broadly in the research lab I run, we have to approach it in a public health way. So if we learned in the public health world that you can't just treat the incidences of diseases like cardiac disease and diabetes once they appear and symptomatic and then try to treat the disease, but you also can work much more upstream to educate people about choices they can make um, that would enable them to have healthier lives, what they eat, um, how much they exercise, what their risks are, that that public health work happens 20 or 30 years before the incidence of the disease. And we, we see that the problem of, uh, of countering far-right extremism very much the same way, that what we have been doing is a very much a securitized approach of trying to prevent a radicalized person from already becoming violent um, by kind of, if you see something, say something, make sure that we barricade the doors, lock the doors at synagogues and churches before service, right? There's this kind of what we would call secondary prevention, um, not just, uh, you know, but, but not engaging earlier. That has historically been what we've done. And I think what we're seeing now is much bigger interest in primary prevention, in preventing people from going down those pathways to begin with while still ensuring freedom of speech and their right to make those choices to believe what they want. Um, but, 
but understanding that it's in all of society's interest to, to ensure that people have better um, skepticism, better digital literacy, better media literacy tools to recognize and reject ideas when they encounter them. It is a much more holistic approach. It requires a lot of engagement with parents, with coaches, with teachers, with faith leaders. And so one of the first things we did in my research lab, which was founded just a little over three years ago before the pandemic started, um, was create a parents and caregivers guide uh, to online radicalization. And we have been uh, distributing, but also testing that guide over the last several years. And right now we're following 1500 parents who read it once to see how they use it, which I can talk about it's really fascinating data on what they did with what they learned. Um, we find that mental health counselors are also really key. Um, we find that uh, grandparents are really, really key in these roles. And so there's a lot of work to be done on the holistic public health approach of educating not only individuals, middle school, high school, college, media literacy classes, but also an entire community around them. Um, we also find that it's important to go right at the heart of the matter and address uh, some of the propaganda that people will encounter through video-based interventions that teach them how to be more skeptical of what they encounter online. And I know you've had another webinar earlier on inoculation. Um, that's our approach, a short form video that uses the phrase inoculation or it's called pre-bunking, which means that you just warn people essentially, you teach them about the possibility that there is information out there that they might counter, encounter that that seeks to manipulate them and then allow them to make their own choices, um, but in a more informed way. And when we do that, we find people are more likely to reject propaganda, more likely to recognize and reject conspiracy theories, not only around the topic that you're talking about, but also there seems to be some sort of blanket of protection, we call it, that conveys some immunity when they encounter other types of conspiracy theories. So an anti-feminist conspiracy theory that someone is taught about um, helps them recognize an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory later, for example. And that's a really interesting um, and helpful finding. We also, and this is a PDF guide that we've created, but we are now, uh, it'll be a portal later this month on the web, which is free. We are doing a lot of work on higher ed campuses where we have seen a lot of swastikas there were nooses hung on my own campus, um, cotton stalks hung on my campus when we had um, the anti-racism center open. I mean, a lot of hate incidents targeting college campuses. And so, and we find that faculty, um, uh, uh, residential leaders, student services, mental health counselors generally are not equipped um, with the tools to know how to handle it, to know what to say. When somebody says something in class that's um, anti-Semitic or anti-immigrant, they don't know how to handle it. They don't know how to uh, draw the line between hate speech and free speech. Uh, and so we have created guides and tools that um, provide guidance to higher ed and are now doing trainings on that as well. So I can talk about that. Um, and the last thing I wanna say is how important it is to make sure this doesn't stay just within our domestic boundaries. We talk about this as domestic violent extremism, but these, hap these trends are happening across the world in many places, not only in so-called Western countries, but we've seen anti-Muslim uh, violence in uh, places like Singapore. We've seen anti-democratic developments in Brazil and India and other places. And um, uh, I had a, a father, a military officer from Pakistan recently tell me that his child, um, uh, one of the teenagers called the other one a boogaloo boy. And he asked what that meant and uh, they'd read it online. And so, you know, they were kind of adopting things that they'd heard from the US uh, context and, and using it in their own um, nation even. So we, one of the things we're committed to is, is translation, adaptation, testing across borders, learning from global experiences. Um, we, uh, 11 members of my team and our funders spent some time in Germany last summer on a study tour. Uh, several of us spent two months there on a, on a program um, to kind of look at what social cohesion might look like and ways to improve it. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work to be done um, still on making sure that these ideas don't just sit in one country, but are constantly discussed across borders. Um, I'm going to end there and just say 
The book itself, um, the Western States Center, which if you don't know them as a terrific democracy strengthening organization has created a free readers discussion guide for the book, which is um, his, right at this uh, westernstatecenter.org backslash hate in the homeland, which has chapter summaries and discussion questions. Um, our website, perilresearch.com has all of our tools for parents, for coaches, caregivers, others, our recent gun attitude study, all free downloadable, including our impact studies. Um, and the Southern Poverty Law Center is our founding partner, has also a lot of our community tools at their site as well, including the translated ones. Um, and so you're welcome to check all of that out, and I hope that you find it useful in your own communities as well. And I will stop sharing now and happy to answer questions. I know I talked yeah, thank, like thank, so thank you. For <laughs> Cynthia, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I guess I was, yeah, I was like, is she even going to get a drink of water? That's a lot. No. <laughs> a lot. I, get... I, I will say while you're, you're, you're having a sip, um, I'm trusting that's water. Uh, I was a little horrified when I saw that run DMC logo, not run no. DMC logo. It's like, no. what? because I'm yeah. from the generation where that they were a thing like oh my yeah God. um I it felt a little close to home and I've heard you talk about this you know when you because I'm a stand-up comedian and we've been embroiled in many many you know controversies when you talk about the weaponization of humor uh which is hard for me because I'm from the George Carlin school of comedy so to speak where you you don't punch down you don't use it to hurt people who can't yeah. defend themselves or who are, you know, marginalized in any way. So this is, um, that cuts a little close to home for me. Um, I, I, I know that you talked about a lot of this seems focused on how we can help kids or, or, or young people, you know, why are young people more susceptible than older adults or are they, you know, because I think um, the average age of folks that were involved in January 6th was 40. These are people who are not, or, or who may no longer be um, in, a, in a continuing education thing. How do, how do we reach grown folks as well? Yeah, you know, with these yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's really interesting because prior to the pandemic, the data showed that the greatest risk of violence, the group with the greatest risk, it was always under age 35. And so we tend to think of you know, our intervention group Primarily, and I will say in my research in Germany, when I interviewed young men um, about who were in and around neo-Nazi and far-right scenes for years um, would tell me, you know, and ask them around what age did you first get involved? It was always somewhere between 12 and 15, um, sometimes 13, 16, right? But 12, 13, 14. So it's really sort of the onset of puberty um, and the freedom that comes with it and this, the very awakenings of a little bit of political consciousness that comes, exploration of ideas. And then it really depends a lot on who you meet, right? So at that time in Germany, when I was first doing it, it really was your older brother, your cousins, guys on, you know, in the park or the playground who kind of swept you up in a youth culture that for many of them, they didn't know anything different, right? It was their entire scene, not unlike an urban gang in that sense. in some of these neighborhoods where a lot of young men were part of it and they just it took a long time for them to come out of it to learn that there were other ways of life. Um, I think in an online context, that's a little bit different, um, but it is it is so much more coming at you. And so what I always say is, is, is my assumption is that everybody encounters hateful content, supremacist ideas in some form or another. Either you're the recipient of hate mail, hateful context, trolling as a targeted group member, or you're encountering it, you're observing that, right? And it's, and of course, everyone encounters it all the time. And sometimes, you know, we reject it, we just move on, we ignore it. Other times people get into a dialogue with somebody in a game and then they introduce them, they send them a URL, a private chat room link, it opens up pathways, right? And so there's just the possibility of so many more pathways opening up. That happens, I'm still most worried about young people because they're spending a lot more time online. They're more um, in, see, in a seeking mode in terms of trying to yeah. figure out their own identity, right? And um, so they're more at risk for impulsive decisions. I mean, there's a lot of things about adolescents and young adults that, that um, make them still a higher risk group. I also think they're more reachable. And so I find that, you know, while they're still in school, 
while they're still in athletic engagements where they have coaches and mentors and employers or the parents of their friends or people who still really actually have quite an influence on them while their ideas are forming and being shaped, it's a really great time to intervene and create off-ramps to some of those pathways that might be opening up. And that's true for all kinds of dangerous things, uh, eating disorders or addictions or yes. other problematic behaviors that young people might be engaging in, not only for extremist ideas, it's just one of those pathways. But at the same time, when the pandemic hit, absolutely everybody went online. And we saw that actually there's a whole generation of older adults that don't have the, the um, skeptical uh, media literacy built in. And in some cases were even more susceptible because they hadn't spent very much time online and suddenly were spending huge amounts of time online, um, isolated, bored, way too much time online, and then really susceptible to disinformation. And so, um, you know, what we don't really know yet is as we come out of the pandemic, you know, and older adults get busier again, get back in their lives, you know, are we gonna see a, a change in that or not? But absolutely that moment in time those two or three years disrupted the data. There's just no question about it. It's just not clear to me yet whether that's a trend. And I'm still most worried, still most, the most violent acts of terrorism, generally speaking, not overwhelmingly, you know, not all the time, but generally speaking, still tend to be young men, um, even though we have seen some recent mass shooters who are older. Wow. Wow. I, and, I, and I thought women had a hard time navigating puberty. <laughs> that that yeah. seems to be the the the, the crux yeah. of it there um not to minimize what you're saying of course but yes yeah. i that is very difficult time for young folks as we say around here their brains are still smooth uh and and honestly i i think it's up until age 25 until we our brains actually yeah. become adult you would think yeah. uh, that we, we understood the real investment that it takes to to raise good humans we wouldn't have money for anything else um, yeah. Robert yeah. has a, a question, and, and I will ask, uh, what role, if any, does religion play in the ideologies of these groups? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so there is a subset of these groups that are Christian nationalists, um, and so you do see some uh, engagement with um, anti-Semitism in particular, or Islamophobia um, playing a role as a way of demonizing the other. Um, you do see some, um, some engagement like that, but, it's, but it's, not, um, it's not as predictable or as clear as you think. So we have some groups, for example, who are uh, far right, who advocate for LGBTQ rights as Western rights. Um, and then, especially in Europe, and in, in uh, political parties who are far right have actually attracted voters from the left by arguing that you have to stem the flow of immigration from Muslim countries. So they're making a kind of Islamophobic argument about women's and LGBTQ rights, saying if you have more Muslim immigrants, it's gonna reduce the rights. So religion plays a role in, in an odd way there, right? Where it's positioned as uh, sort of conservative religion, uh, Im conservative immigrants would threaten Western values even though other far right groups are very anti LGBTQ, um, anti feminist, right? And so would, would make different claims, uh, sometimes rooted in, in Christianity or conservative or fundamentalist evangelical Christianity. So we actually have a project in the lab with a multi faith uh, group in Texas um, to develop a peace builders toolkit for faith communities. And we find that pastors are, um, if you find the right people, that pastors are one of the best. Um, best groups uh, uh, to work with in terms of having the trust of their local communities, right? So teachers can be great, but lots of kids are already checked out. Schools are overwhelmed. Teachers are overwhelmed. School counselors, you know, I mean, you have like two school counselors for schools of 2000 kids and they're in mental health crisis. Like there's only so much you can expect of formal education systems, but but pastors, religious leaders, um, imams, and uh, rabbis, you know, folks leading communities that voluntarily go to them uh, can play a huge role. And so we're really excited about the possibility of scaling up those kinds of toolkits for faith communities where they can also have parent circles, where they already have teenagers meeting in Sunday school, 
um, there's just a lot of possibilities there, I think. You uh, actually answered uh, a bit of my, the next question I wanted to share um, from Lou, and thank you, Lou, uh, who said in many problems, it seems uh, a bit cliche to have education and teachers to address them. Uh, for example, radicalization, critical thinking, climate change, science and math, it goes on and on and on. Isn't there a limit uh, to expecting schools uh, glibly to solve everything? And you just addressed yes. that, but oh, I thought that was a good question. Yes. Yes. I'm so glad as a teacher, as a professor, you know, I will say, I already, I feel overwhelmed and I am not a K to 12 teacher, but I come from a family of teachers. I know that, um, you know, when you have in our local schools here in DC, just, uh, you know, kids going through their whole high school year without an English teacher, without a history teacher. I mean, there's massive teacher shortages, teachers filling in, they're overwhelmed post pandemic era. Um, the anxiety, depression, the PTSD, self-harm, suicidal ideation going on among young people right now is off the charts and teachers are asked to solve that. They're asked to be on the front lines for a lot of this stuff. So, and huge learning gaps, right? Um, so the actual learning is behind and, and the scores are low. So I absolutely agree they're overburdened. We, um, that's, we're, we emphasize much more heavily actually the extracurricular. Um, so both the pastors, the youth mentors, we do a lot of work with parents, grandparents, coaches, I think are great, um, and mental health counselors. But we do work with teachers and educators when they want to. We don't actually have a tool just for teachers and educators in part for that reason. Um, but digital media literacy happens in a lot of other places. It doesn't have, and maybe even most effectively not in the classroom, right? It's like, right. but in places, you know, where you might already be spending some time uh, where people can have conversations. So one of the things we found with parents that I'm really um, happy about is that uh, parents in our research, if we study everything that we produce, we test it, um, you know, pre and post test. It's statistically significant before we release things. And both Republicans and Democrats uh, come to the table as parents worried about what their kids are seeing online. Um, and we find they're both above the bar in terms of their satisfaction with our tools. Um, Democrats tend to be a little more satisfied, but they're both above the bar satisfied and Republicans learn more than Democrats do from our parents and caregivers guides. So they score higher at the end. And, you know, we, um, we just think it's really important that that there are partisan aspects to some of this, but not not when it comes to protecting youth from and protecting people from what they're encountering online. It has to be a much broader issue, and we're really glad to see um, that 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 is that parents in particular will come to the table across those divides because this is a moment when parents are not always showing that um, when it comes to issues of education. Um, one of the things that I I found maybe surprising but not so how big a problem this is in the United States um, and, and, and bigger than in other parts of the world, even though it is global. Um, Joe wants to know, are these hate movements concentrated in some regions of the United States or in some states, mm -hmm. or is it really all 50 that have a problem here? Yeah, um, there are some states that have bigger problems than others. Um, in terms of the volume of propaganda that's being produced online. So if you look at the kind of, you can geolocate where where things are coming from for the most part. Um, and uh, you do see concentrations and you see concentrations of the groups, but it's not always that clear. So like Texas and California, you know, we'll have a lot of hate groups, but they also have a lot of people, right? So there's, you know, it's it's the high population states, of course, produce a lot more um, uh, hate groups. And hate. So, so it's, you have to look at the data in a way that is also proportionate to the population. And then um, we find that the same case in other countries. So in Germany, where I worked for all these years, uh, historically, it was a case that um, attitudes were there's more support for the far right in the East, but there's actually higher incidence of violence in the West. So, you know, the patterns aren't always as clear as you think. And if you look on something like the hate map, um, you know, that SPLC produces, like they're neo-Nazi groups, that image I showed you of the American young men, that was in New York City in Manhattan. So, you know, that I lived in Manhattan at that time, that was um, at a pride parade, I think, was the, was the actual parade where that was, Shown, and that's you know, there's a neo-Nazi group in Brooklyn, so it's 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 not um, 
that there's no immunity from it geographically, I would say. And there are, but there are some pockets and they're a little bit different. There's some places that have a little more um, militia activity and uh, unlawful militia activity. And there's some places that have a little more of the white supremacist activity. So the problem is, um, you know, there's a lot of problems in a lot of different states, but I don't think any states scot free. Well, this leads to my next question from Hewitt. Um, what, what explains why far-right radicalization is a global phenomenon mm -hmm. now? I mean, is it is it really just the internet or, you know, is it that, I mean, that's a simple answer to it. But. Yeah, the internet has catalyzed, I think, um, and spread the ideas. And, and, you know, the U.S. produces a lot of the propaganda, an outsized share of the propaganda, white supremacist propaganda that circulates online globally in ways that I think have to be acknowledged and discussed in a lot more detail. If we were seeing this, you know, from other countries that were producing that amount of propaganda, I think there would be more discussion about it. A lot of that has to do with the fact that English language online content spreads more rapidly, is more accessible, it's become this sort of lingua franca. Um, so if English becomes used and then English language propaganda circulates and is, and is cited and taken up, but you know, I think um, there are there, this spread of one major conspiracy theory that grew very quickly called the Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory. Most people got to know that after the Buffalo um, terrorist attacks. Some people remember it from the Christchurch New Zealand one as well. Uh, it was also featured, unfortunately, as a, a motivating factor uh, related conspiracy theory in the Oslo terrorist attack in 2011. So. We've seen, you know, multiple, um, which is, you know, killed 77 people, mostly young people at a teenage, at a summer camp. Um, so, you know, you have three countries there, but you also have it uh, in El Paso, Texas against um, Latino, you know, targeting Latinos. You had it, that, that same conspiracy theory targeting um, Jews in Pittsburgh the African-American community in Buffalo, Muslims in, in Christchurch, New Zealand, young progressive uh, members of a future political party, uh, future members of a political party in, in Oslo. So one of the things that conspiracy theory did is it made it a, a broad range of enemies. Um, so and there's a lot of different targets for the you know, great, for their great replacement conspiracy theory. If, if you're just saying it could be immigrants, it could be Jews, it could be Muslims, it could be um, members of a progressive political party. And so it became this sort of conspiracy theory that united. Um, so if you used to have more local conflicts that were uh, racialized or ethnic group conflicts that were really specific to particular regions, this uniting of this conspiracy theory into you know sort of one big conspiracy theory that was used online in a lot of different countries, it mobilized um, and mobilized and unified them in a, in a lot of more ways than we had seen before. So that's not the only reason. I mean, it, and that couldn't have happened without online spaces quite as easily as it did, but it is part of, I think, what explains what's happened over the last 10 or 12 years um, is the coming together under a much bigger umbrella as if there's one giant conspiracy theory to replace white people with the cultural societies. It's almost like the tofu of uh, radicalization, so to speak. Yes, you know, right. Many groups yeah. can use it. Um, I know yeah. we're getting close to time, but and then everyone's got some great, great comments and, and questions here. Um, but uh, Reinhold says that in Germany, and many of us know this, expressions of right extremism, right extremism or symbols mm -hmm. of Holocaust denial are prosecuted and may lead to incarceration for several years. Do you think that that method is successful or mm -hmm. desirable? Does I it think work? it's... It's a great question. I think this this question about banning and um, the illegality of symbols, it's hard to imagine anything else happening in Germany. Like I understand the historical, the cultural context in Germany and, and that that is hard to get away from. I do think that some of the creativity um, in the game playing, the coding, the, the fueling of, of this culture of getting around the bans, um, comes from that in particular. And it's not just the legal context, right? So one of the schools I studied had a whole list of logos that you couldn't wear into the school. 
and they had to sign it with, you know, school dress code before they would enter the school, all these far right brands and logos. And one of the brands created a Velcro removable label. And so they would take it off. And then it turned up when you turned it around, uh, it actually looked like a, like a V. And so then they said, oh, it's, it's, if you wear it upside down, uh, it is, it means you've been violent or you're willing to be violent. And so the game playing just continued and it was fostered by the band itself. So I'm not a huge fan of bands. And at the same time, I recognize the utility of putting a line in the sand and, and establishing what your values are. And I think sometimes it can make spaces safer, like schools, um, if people know these types of things are not, you're not allowed to wear this hateful content on your shirt, um, but also know that if you do that, you're likely to, to help fuel a possible backlash in more creative ways of working around the band. So I tend to think they are a Band-Aid solution um, that don't solve the problem, but sometimes are necessary. Um, Eric has a comment slash question, and I, I want to squeeze this in, even though I know we're right at the top of the hour. Um, but shouldn't we be putting our efforts into working against polarization in general? Uh, is it a good idea to only worry about right wing and Islamic polarization? I don't think you are, but I, I know that that question yeah. has come up. I would say I really hope that we never take our eyes off the ball of anything again. I think what we did in the U.S. was um, on the terrorism side of things, have this unilateral focus for two decades only on Islamist forms of extremism. And we, and we lost the thread of, of what was, I mean, we meaning the country, the, those, those leading the charge lost the, you know, had blinders on and were unable to see it and now are playing catch up. I think that um, anything on the violent fringe, we should anticipate. And I, and I will say like, I worry a lot about climate uh, about the climate movement turning more violent, um, even though I'm sympathetic to, you know, we already see escalations with, with paint, with, you know, paint on art forms, because when people get so frustrated, so extreme, and I'm not saying monitor or surveil or whatever, but I'm just saying, keep an eye on any form of potential violence that could harm people, cause harm and target. I still think that um, what we're seeing on the far right is, is, different than any form of violence that you're seeing uh, from the far left. There's no equivalence in terms of the threat landscape. We know that in the data, but I think it's important to monitor the whole range. And there have been periods of time in the 1970s when Marxist Leninist forms of terrorism were the biggest form of political violence in the U.S. And so I think in, in the West more broadly. So you can, you know, it's important to keep an eye on all of it, but also focus where the biggest threats are. So that's not to say that someone else should be working on, you know, building social cohesion and reducing polarization. We do some of that as well in our lab. And I think building trust in communities, a stronger sense of belonging, stronger sense of purpose, um, which we work on in our community-based work in states is to us a theory of change that reduces violence by promoting some of those social cohesion elements that we know are associated with less violence in the long run. Um, so that's important too. And, uh, but not, not what I was talking about in this particular book, but some of the things we do and some of the community-based work we do. Well, and I guess the short of it is there's a lot of work to go around for all of us on this. Yeah, and, and it's on sure. many spokes of the wheel. Um, Cynthia, thank you so much um, for, for your book, for your time, for the work you're doing in the world. Um, I don't know if you get to thank hear you. that enough, uh, but, but really, thank you. Um, and I just want to let everyone know um, if you missed any of this presentation, uh, it has been recorded and it will be available uh, tomorrow for you to catch up, rewatch, and share at skepticalinquirer.org. And as always, uh, my thanks to Skeptical Inquirer, the Center for Inquiry. Uh, tonight's producer, Mike Powell, thank you so much. We could not do this without you. And of course, a big thanks to all of you in the audience for your time and attention tonight. Uh, my name is Liam Board. Uh, thank you and good night. Cynthia, thanks again. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for the great questions. And I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them, but- um, So am I, uh, so am I. We could do an, easily do a part two of this. <laughs> definitely. Have a good thank night and so good luck with the puppy. <laughs> thank you.